Good evening, or morning, or whenever, and welcome to another episode of Cooking with Grief, the podcast where nothing is true and everything is permitted. Wait, no, that's Assassin's Creed. Cooking with Grief is the one with all the references to bodily fluids. My name's Chris, and as always, I'm joined by my effervescent, ever-present, evanescent co-host, who is also called Chris. How are you doing? Very well. I've got my podcasting pyjamas on. Oh, that's and, very uh, nice. I feel very, very comfy, and I feel like they're going to serve me in good stead. Do you have Doc Martens How are you? slippers on? Obviously, I <laughs> wear Doc Martens at all times. I am well. What are you wearing? I am not wearing podcasting pyjamas, and I'll leave the rest to your imagination. This episode's going to suck, but you will hear audible dong noises in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to explain the format, obviously if you've been with us this long and you haven't put a bullet through your brain, then you probably <laughs> know it. <laughs> But basically, it's Reddit's Today I Learned in uh, audio form. We've uh, each brought two secret topics to surprise and delight the other, and hopefully you too. And on that note, Chris, please take us away. Okay, so for my first topic this week, I read an article in which famous people, you know, sort of writers, uh, actors, athletes, musicians, were asked to give some advice to their 16-year-old self. And a lot of it was sort of like well-meaning but meaningless aphorisms. Don't give up on your dreams, believe in yourself, follow your instincts, stuff like that. You know, the sort of thing you'd find on like a mass-produced six-quid IKEA poster. Live the life you have, drink like no one's watching don't let your dreams be dreams yeah exactly yeah that's sort of meaningless vaguely positive stuff so my topic this week is i've i've written some bits of advice that i would give my 16 year old self if you can think of any of your own then please feel free to chip in or you know see if you agree or disagree so number one learn to cook a few dishes you don't need to become a a really good chef or anything just have a sort of i don't know a, a staple rotation of 10 to 12 dishes that are cheap and fairly quick to make but it's a good skill to have just basic culinary skills because if you're sort of introverted like me then actually cooking is quite a good cheat code to having a social life because you can invite people around and they can do the sort of socializing bit and you can cook that's very growing up advice i'm just trying to imagine your 16 year old self hosting a dinner party i mean my first two meals at university were pot noodle but after that i feel like i quite rapidly got better like when you're sort of forced in actually i say that I say, because I felt like I was forced into doing that, but I knew people at uni who never learned how to cook at all for, like, the years they were there. It's had a weird diet of takeaway and pot noodles, and I was like... Whereas I was just like, how are you affording all this? Like, I was forced by necessity to, like, buy cheap shit and throw it together. And Again, it still took me years. It's not until relatively recently before I started making dinners where I was actually quite enjoying eating them. (laughs) I would also like to point out, this is the first time we've had a serious discussion about cooking on Cooking With Grief. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I didn't even think of that. And I'd like to add, my 16-year-old self going to uni, I'd say, buy a slow cooker, because they are amazing. And you leave it for eight hours. You don't even have to look at it. You throw all the stuff in and you walk off and you come back and it's nice. Number two, uh, learn to be okay on your own. I think it's an undervalued skill in society. It's one that's not celebrated. It's almost always seen as a negative. At 16, whether or not you're sociable or or popular, there is still a social framework around you that makes you interact with people. As soon as that goes away, whether you go to uni or not, particularly if you have to move away from, like, a small town or, you know, like, where you're big fish in a small pond, then it can actually be quite a lonely experience. And I think learning to do things on your own and take simple pleasure, like going to the cinema on your own or going to museums or cultivating hobbies that you can do by yourself is quite a useful skill. Usually very okay being on my own. Being able to afford a flat on my own and not having to share a house with anybody is honestly the greatest thing ever. Um, Hence the new podcasting. Exactly. And yet it was only very recently that I went to a cinema for the first time on my own. Even though when you go to a cinema... I'm one of those people who wants everybody to shut up. I don't want it to be a social occasion, and yet I insist on having somebody to go with. It's a weird thing that so many first dates are films when it's like the false intimacy of sitting next to someone, where you both stare in the same direction, not talking for two hours. And okay, maybe you've got something to talk about afterwards. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I wish there was less of a social stigma on being fine on your own. I had a weird thing where, like, because I play team sports but I'm also very like quite introverted so that sort of was enough for me I was like I had my you know weekend that you know play sport and train like midweek or whatever and that would be my social interaction with everybody and then I was usually like and that's enough like I had a laugh I spoke to everybody got on 
And then I was like, was okay spending the rest of the week on my own. But then when you sort of lose that, when you like become an adult and have less time, you're yeah, right. Like it does become quite, I mean, like I said, because that's not exactly like a rip roaring social life, but when you got not even that, it does become quite hard. So yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Right. Okay. Well, speaking of having less time when you're working, uh, make better use of your time when you're 16, especially summer holidays. Now, I thought about this because yes, is I, I think I took for granted just how long summer holidays last. Like it can be two, three months of the year when you have very few responsibilities. Like there are very few times in life when you'll get that length of unbroken time with almost nothing to do. Basically, not again till you retire. We both work full-time now, and I get four weeks off a year, which I can take in either four one-week bursts or two two two-week bursts. And then be like, and now that has to last me all the way through until next holiday period. Yeah, yeah. It's like a whole year from now. It's it's, You're looking down the the barrel of a long gun when you come back off your holidays. It's like you don't get another, like, more than two days off in a row for... At least six months, you know. <laughs> Let's say you, you know, you're 16 and you, you might want to, if you're interested in any like creative pursuit, that summer holiday is a great time to, I don't know, make a short film with your friends or write mm-hmm. a series of short stories or, or even like intern in like an industry that you might be interested in. In terms of internship though, like I'd say do a job that you're in that time, do something that you're not really, especially if it's like unpaid or something, do it in an industry which you're not currently working towards. Because like, um, we've had it, we've had interns this summer. I was just like, why? This is your last chance to have a summer holiday and you're wasting it doing, <laughs> you're wasting it at a job that you're going to be doing something similar to for the next 40 years. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying every every working moment has to be spent towards a career and stuff, but it's a good way of, of testing the waters for something before you commit, commit yeah, to doing so. like a degree in it or something or like because I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know maybe. what I did with my summer holidays but I know it wasn't much it was mostly writing I didn't even do that much I wish I'd set myself sort of stricter goals like I'm not saying like you know mm-hmm. at, like work your ass off for your summer holidays because you do need a break but I just I know I just wish I'd done more with me summer holidays or at least appreciated them more for for the you know the length of time yeah. that they actually were you know so it seems like we both agree on that one. So finally, number five, it's absolutely fine to not have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Luther King's like, <laughs> thrown out speech. <laughs> like his first draft of the speech is like, no, 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 this won't do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if if someone had talked him out of it at the last second, you know, I didn't. God, do you remember your dreams? I'm good. I, I don't. Just uh, something about a mouse. I don't know. Anyway, right. Well, lo- lovely buffet. It's lasagna tonight. Got a DJ who's come all the way from Sheffield. My sense of history is uh, mostly based on working men's clubs. <laughs> Now then, we've got a comedian. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, all right, maybe not a dream. It's fine to not have any idea what you're going to be. The do- the days of, like, a job for life, I think, are gone. <laughs> I was going to say you don't work in my industry, as <laughs> it very much is. Well, not even necessarily job for life in this particular company, but there's a very small number of companies that do similar related things and everybody seems to have worked together at some point in this very small pool. Oh, okay, but that... That's more specialised. I was thinking more in terms of like, mm-hmm. here's the problem with being 16. It, it's a, you're trapped in a weird position where all the grown-ups around you are treating you like a child, but you're expecting you to act like an adult. Yeah. You get, you, you get no opportunity to be responsible, but uh, still, it, mm-hmm. the assumption is still that you're still an idiot. Like, around 16, 17, you're asked to make very serious decisions. Like, the first really big sort of decisions about your life and hopefully you know in an ideal world your parents and teachers will help you make those decisions but at the end of the day like you can study the the subjects you want you could leave school if you want you can start making your first big independence decisions and it's a it's a weird like switch that goes from like oh no no no, wait till you're 18 wait till you're 18 wait till you're 18 you're only 16 and then suddenly all right, make make these big decisions. You're old enough to make them by now. I find it weird in like in a way it starts even earlier. And like when you teach GCSEs, like I essentially chose my career when I was fourteen. You know, like choosing which options to take at GCSE. Yeah, because you're focused on science. Yeah, exactly. And there are obviously chances to sort of move away from that to a degree. 
But, you know, you need to choose something. I chose my strongest subjects. It's a good thing to say, right, I enjoy these subjects or I'm good at these subjects. Therefore, like, I shall follow them based on my available options. It's a lot yeah. different to say, right, this is my dream and this is what I will accomplish. And also, I never had a specific dream in mind and I always felt like I ought to. And I don't know whether that's me or mm-hmm. whether... The, I, but I did feel that it was like an ex- external pressure to to want one thing. Yeah, well, it was always was like pick... Well, because obviously university is such a like huge, well, time and financial commitment. It's sort of like, well, this better be worth it. So you better be aiming for something. And I had the really weird thing where, <laughs> um, like I say, I chose science and engineering as a path. I actually ended up taking a year out of university. Had to think about, you know, I had a whole year to think about what I could do. Well, we made that short film and stuff, but we never re- you know, didn't really push it too hard and, um, ended up going back to university to study engineering because <laughs> that was the best idea I could think. Normally you become multimillionaires from the first short film you make. So it was unusual that it hadn't happened to us. Well, yeah, that was the plan. Yeah. I gave up after that. I was like, Hollywood is bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, this industry is just rotten to the core because our <laughs> short film didn't even get shortlisted on uh, the Channel 4 competition or whatever it was. But it did get longlisted, so I count as a win. Was that not just the list of all the <laughs> list of all the entries? No, it wasn't, because there was some that I saw on YouTube that had been submitted, but it weren't on the website. Losers. No, we made the long losers. list. Aha, exactly. No, we're losers. <laughs> yes, we are, that's true. I still put on my CV, uh, you know, in the hobbies and interests of, like... I've had a short film featured on the uh, Channel 4 website. Oh, I, I should do that, because I was I was a part of that. You were. You were 50% of that. You know, at my weight at the time, probably about 80% sort of <laughs> mass-wise. <laughs> <laughs> I've slimmed down a little since then, but... um. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so what you were saying was don't laser too much on something and have room to wiggle. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I guess, like, if you, you keep your eye on the horizon for something you've believed in for a long time, that you can miss, like, more interesting opportunities closer to the ground because you're so focused on this this far thing. It was more just like, if you're 16 and you're suddenly feeling the weight of expectation on all these decisions you're, you're making, life is much longer than people give it, give it credit for, and you can spend a lifetime working out what you want to do and what brings you joy, and discovering that is as important as doing the thing itself. But, can I just ask then? Why am I, Why is my life such a failure <laughs> since then? No, I oh. was going to, well, no, because I was going to say, <laughs> why are you such a disappointment? It's a de- <laughs> totally different question. <laughs> no, I don't know, you'll have to ask all my family. Fair play. I just thought, you know, Advice for a 16-year-old was an interesting avenue to go down because in the article I read, like, all the people they interviewed were a bit older and it's like they'd forgotten what it was what, what it was like to be a 16-year-old almost. Like, they were... You, you know who you are at 16 and you've known for a long time and you're much much more secure in yourself than society gives you credit for but also you, give, you yourself give you, you know, credit for. I think, anyway. I don't know. It wasn't the funniest topic but hopefully it was... We can get something out of it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your advice to 16-year-olds. Let's just see how well you know me. What is my second favourite animal? Well, obviously your first favourite is the bandicoot, so I think your second one is the aardvark? Wrong and wrong. My first favourite is actually sharks, because I was a very strange child, and when all the other kids wanted to swim with dolphins and were obsessed with dolphins in primary school, I really just wanted a pet shark. Or you're a big fan of Chinese soup. No, that used to make me really sad. <laughs> I remember writing my Christmas list to Santa once when I must have been about six or something, or whatever age it is when you still were. I wanted a shark, but I wasn't stupid, so I also asked for a shark tank. <laughs> well, obviously, obviously you've got to have the, uh, the yeah. accessories. Anyway, my second favourite animal are crows. The reason I bring that up is because um, there is a theme oh, park. Oh, I thought that was, that was the topic. <laughs> yeah, just, no, that was my just two favourite animals. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> she was like, my advice to my 16-year-old self is sharks are difficult to look after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, they'll eat through a crow. <laughs> um, news recently that a theme park in France has employed crows to clean up the park. Oh, for because they're they're attracted to shiny things? No, because... Oh, that's magpies. Yeah, although magpies are just a type of crow. 
or corvid, as your Latin would suggest. Also, I think the scientific name for a crow is a corvus corax, which, besides being the uh, primarch of the raven wing, uh, raven guard, sorry, <laughs> it also, also just means crow crow in Latin and Greek. It's just the crow crow. Well, you know, they're so good you've got to say it twice. <laughs> um, but anyway, they're actually just really smart birds, which is why I like them, because they're like... Well, I like them because, A, they strut around like they're... Uh, I don't know, like they've just got a bit of swagger about them. Back to the theme park and the crows, they, um, they've they been taught to collect stuff like uh, cigarette butts and other bits of small rubbish in exchange for um, food. I thought you were going to say tokens for the rides. <laughs> Although I imagine roller coasters and stuff probably feel fairly like tame when you can literally fly. <laughs> like, hey, I have the sensation of flying and it's just like, why? <laughs> But yeah, apparently they uh, they fly around, they pick the uh, bits of rubbish up, take it to a bin, and then they get food as a reward, which I thought was quite clever, really. I mean, you can't really... It's weird, animal intelligence is because we sort of always define it by the fact that we can teach animals to do something. We're like, therefore, that animal must be clever. With animals like, say, cats, I always feel like they understand what you're trying to teach them. They just don't give a shit. <laughs> like, like, I feel like a cat could do most of the tricks you can teach a dog. They just don't want to and don't care enough to like try and entertain you. Yeah, they don't, you. Want to, don't want to demean themselves. Yeah, I always just get that feeling like you can't really prove it, but I'm, you just see it in their eyes. You're like, you know what I want you to do. You ju- you're just a dick. That's the thing is, I don't, if you ever t- like meow back at your cat, they do look at you like you're just talking nonsense, <laughs> mate. Yeah. What was that? Because it wasn't it. There was a study done, and it's like dogs know that we're not dogs, but like us anyway. Mm-hmm. Whereas cats just think we're big, clumsy, stupid cats. Yeah, I didn't know that. Or that might have been a a cartoon. I saw. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you can't. I've seen somebody who did teach their cat to play the like play the piano in exchange for. I mean, they couldn't play anything good, but you know, like they'd get yeah, keys yeah. in a certain order and they'd get food. Look, we've all seen those cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> you know, they're not actually playing. They're just someone's just bashing their hands on the keyboard. Um, to go back to crows, um, I I know the thing that not only can crows recognise certain humans, so they know to avoid certain people and you know, which ones are friendly. But they will also go back and te- teach other crows which are, the, which are the friendly ones and which are the aggressive ones. Yeah, I think they wore masks because I think it was an experiment because scientists are insane sometimes. And I think they wore masks to annoy crow and it would attack them, you know, with a dive bomb after them. But then it also, if that same person went by other crows in the same group, those crows would also attack them. Like it's told... You know, like as if the crows are communicating and said, that guy's a dick. Yeah, so it like, wasn't random. It was like targeted stuff, you know, because they obviously showed like, it wasn't like all the crows were aggressively attacking anybody who got near. It was only specific individuals. And then there was a thing where crows have been shown to uh, drop uh, nuts or whatever, uh, seeds onto um, main roads so that cars run it over and crack them. And then they wait for it to turn red and then they swoop in and eat them. It's only, you know, so long before they start nicking popcorn and then, you know, sort of MacGyver up a magnifying glass to make popcorn. Exactly. They're up to something. Oh, and they can speak. Well, because you can teach crows to speak, you know, like parrots. Turns out crows can also do it, although they sound really... You know, like how um, parrots sound like quite nice and it's quite funny with their like quite high-pitched voice. Whereas crows just sound terrifying like, because they, they just got really deep voices. But there was one on the news that um, somebody found that had a Yorkshire accent. They think it had escaped. Like, they found it in the wild, but it was a type of crow that normally lives in Africa. So they're pretty sure it's someone's pet rather than one that's just been hanging around outside Greg's. But it was like, oh, you know, they got it to, it would speak and be like, you're all right, love. I'm all right. <laughs> like, that's just all it would say. I hope. I'd prefer it was a wild one. Well, did you know um, Edgar Allan Poe's um, short story, The Raven, um, was originally um, called The Parrot because he originally thought that's the only bird that could speak until he learned that ravens, which are, you know, the same ballpark in terms of, you know, COVID facts were just thrown around. I don't know whether to believe you or not. They could speak. Because you're saying it with such confidence that I want to believe you. Yeah. I just can't imagine a story that, that's quite like dark. You know, I feel like a bright red parrot would <laughs> just quite ruin the atmosphere. Well, that's the thing. Is that's why when when he found out that ravens could can imitate language, then it, he had one that actually fit his macabre 
oeuvre. Yeah. And more French words, <laughs> like pompomousse <laughs> and... Go on. Uh, You're doing so well. Cheese toasty. I actually know that one. Oh, no, I don't. I know cheese and ham toasty. Croque monsieur. Oh, wait, what's a croque madame? No, that's the one with a fried egg on. Oh, is it? I know... I- and a croque anglais, uh, an, an English croque, is a uh, corned beef. <clears throat> there you go. I was very proud of myself. I was in France and I ordered myself a ham and cheese toasty in French. I was like, un croque monsieur, s'il vous plaît. But then I was asked a follow-up question, like, did I want it cut in half? And I had no idea what like it was in French. I was just like, pardon. <laughs> so you ordered, <laughs> you... <laughs> ordered another one. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting with learning languages because you learn stock phrases and then no more. So mm-hmm. when I first moved to China, then we sort of didn't know what anything was, but we had a few stock phrases. So me and a friend, we went for, for breakfast somewhere and there was like a stall by the side of the road and they were doing like sort of pancakes and, you know, you could pick what ingredients you want in it. So we, we just sort of, you know, go, up, hello, good morning. We would like to buy something. And they're just sort of looking at us and then would say, two, please. And, go, <laughs> and obviously what they said next was, well, what do you want in them? And we'd go, two, please. <laughs> and they're going, okay, yeah, but I mean, you you get the pancake as standard, but obviously what, what ingredients do you want? We would like two of these things, please. <laughs> like I'd rather talk to a crow, at least they'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, that was COVID intelligence. Please, can you give us your next topic? I was trying to think of something clever and funny to say, and I really struggled and just made an unnecessarily dramatic pause. Uh, I enjoyed it. It wasn't the <laughs> slickest link we've ever done, but you know we're going to press on. Chris, have you ever had the fantasy of just wanting to disappear? Just quit your job, maybe move to another another country, grow a beard, just disappear? Yeah, I think we all have at some point. I always wanted to quit in dramatic fashion. You ever just want to like, you know, just pick up a laptop or something and just walk like... Just walk throw it out the window and just be like I'm done. <laughs> I always think those things are better in your head because what would happen is it bounce off the window. And everyone <laughs> would look at you yeah. and you go, "Yeah, yeah, I, I quit." <laughs> Do you not remember the time the uh, that aircraft steward had had enough of? He was they were on the ground and he'd had enough. I think he either just landed or just taken up uh, just before takeoff. Yeah, he just had enough. He just opened the door, took a bottle of champagne, <laughs> put the emergency slide out, and just slid out. <laughs> Like, fuck y'all. Made an announcement of the intergo and going, you can all go fuck yourselves. <laughs> took a bottle of vodka, I think it was, <laughs> and just took the slide down. And they were delayed for like six hours. I mean, he's ruined his life, but what a but story. What a way to yeah, go. Like, what a way to ruin your yeah. life. I mean, if yeah, just any any chance where you get to flip the bird at as many people as possible <laughs> who have made your life miserable is a life well lived. And I hope he's doing well. But we're not alone in this fantasy because in Japan, there's the phenomenon of jahatsu or evaporated people. Because more than 100,000 people a year choose to completely disappear from their current lives. And they hire companies to change their names, addresses, business ties, sort of all legal documentations. They leave in the middle of the night. They have drivers that will take them to a like a new town normally like more rural if it's it's normally like urban to rural migration and they just completely sever ties with their whole life and start again anew sure it's not like people um, who are hiding from the yakuza it could have been <laughs> the uh, articles i read said it was down to essentially japanese work culture mm. of being so work stressed yeah um and there's another word uh karoshi which is the uh, phenomenon of committing suicide because of over- overworking it may be it's not even necessarily suicide there's a word for just death by overwork because people have been known to just have heart attacks you know stress related heart attacks and whatnot basically japanese companies up until recently had voluntary overtime limits so there was no no legal limit for when you had to send your employees home and because the work culture is so competitive then it means that you know everyone's working over time and and if that eventually br- breaks then sometimes people just you know overnight give up their life they also apparently have a sort of culture of um you can't leave until your boss leaves is sort of the general etiquette and your boss can't leave till his mm. boss leaves and his boss can't leave and, till, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, you're basically, everybody's waiting essentially for the CEO to finish. 
And the CEO ha- has a penthouse apartment <laughs> at the top of the office complex yeah. and never needs to leave. I remember reading somewhere once, apparently, like, nodding off at your desk is actually considered, you know, obviously in England, if you fall asleep. <laughs> Someone was in a meeting the other day and they uh, fell asleep and started snoring. They were on the phone, so they must have been, like, working from home or something, and apparently started snoring. <laughs> and it was frowned upon. But laugh at. But yeah, apparently in Japan, falling asleep at your desk is actually a badge of pride. Like, it means that you've worked so hard and you've had so little sleep and you're so exhausted that you can't even keep your eyes open. You must be working so hard. Obviously, it has to only be, like, a very short, like, few seconds nod off. Like, you can't just, like, <laughs> fall asleep at your desk for, like, six hours and then just everyone gives you a round of applause. Like, that guy must be working solid. Yeah, he just comes in, like, in a sleeping bag and went, lads, I am prepared for a long snooze. <laughs> I'll be under the desk if you need me. Yeah. And everyone's going, what a trooper. He should be CEO. <laughs> May he never leave. <laughs> but interestingly, um, you know, another culture like that, the other half of the Axis powers, Germany. Th- though we don't call them anymore. <laughs> no. We've, I, I also, we've moved on. I also said the other half because Italy just struggled to do anything new. I just, you know, I can't speak for you personally, but cooking with grief does not hold on to the grudges of the Second World War. <laughs> no, true. But anyway, Germany... As a rule. <laughs> as a rule. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> giving ourselves some wiggle room. <laughs> but Germany, um, you know, they often have a culture, and we work with a lot of... Uh, like in my work, we work with uh, German companies quite a lot. And, you know, they were explaining that even though Germany has this reputation, you know, all this, they apparently, they're just very strict about separating home and work and keeping them to strict deadlines. So between nine and five, there is apparently, like, no fun. Like, you know, like you have all these offices of, you know, like in London nowadays where they're like, we got slides in the office and ping pong it. Apparently it's none of that. Like, nine to five, you work and you work, like, hard. But apparently, like, as soon as it goes five o'clock, like, you're done and you're on your own time. Like, nobody, like, apparently nobody stays late. Nobody does overtime. Like, it's very much a, you've done, you know, you've had adequate time to do your work if you've worked properly. Now go and get absolutely wasted in one of these Berlin nightclubs that doesn't ever shut. I mean, that does sound very German. <laughs> just, now is the time for work. And now is the time for reverie. Yeah. Is this spastite? Because apparently, because they work with some Americans as well. Uh, I think it might be the same company, but it has an American office. And apparently, yeah, they just get really frustrated with the gym because obviously they, Americans, have a very similar how hard can you work type thing. Um, yeah, no, no one's going to the pub at lunch. Yeah. And apparently they, yeah, they get really, like, they apparently keep sending really arsy emails to the Germans, like, being like, why are you not available? Like, it's 5.05. I need to, and they're just like, well, tough shit, because we're gone. As they're pulling on the ladder hose and <laughs> going, look, it's my time. It's like, we did See, all our work. no outdated stereotypes here. <laughs> I mean, what, what's interesting about, you know, like, everyone having a smartphone in the, the pocket, you know, is that it is blurring the lines. If everyone's accessible all the time, it is blurring the lines between mm-hmm. demarcated home time and work time. You know, it, like, this past week, there was a thing on the BBC that commuting time, which can be hour, hour and a half, two hours for some people, mm-hmm. is spent doing work stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's like, well, you're not getting paid for that time, no. but... It's it's slowly becoming part of the culture. I, Whereas in France, I think they they have the rever- the opposite thing where they encourage people to not answer work emails. Yeah, they want like, to try to on turn. weekends and. and I'm sure I can't remember if it was the law or just a company introduced it or something where they literally turned the servers off at seven so that emails wouldn't get through after seven p.m. I got an email that so I came into the office this morning, like you know, logged into my emails. And some unread ones from yesterday to look. You know, usually they're like from, you know, five, maybe six, or whatever. Somebody had emailed me at ten past eleven at night. And I was just like, why are you not asleep? Or at least relaxing or literally anything that, like, isn't work. Giveaway of, of your rock and roll life. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is twenty past ten. Why have you not had your holics? Yeah, why not? And turn the wireless off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the... Uh, few benefits of working for a, uh, I don't know, I'll just say a, a giant supermarket chain mm-hmm. is that because I'm completely expendable, then no one wants me outside of work <laughs> at all. So it's so it's like I, I like walk through the door and I'm in customer service mode and I remove all traces of having a personality mm-hmm. and I just scan things and put products on shelves and smile at people who I despise. But it means that when I walk out again, then that place is 
dead to me. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it was a Japanese supermarket, then I would never leave. <laughs> Quite possibly not. So that's the second of my two topics, and now Chris is going to furnish us with his last one. Chris, what have you got for us? So, Chris, what's my third favourite animal? <laughs> Show me Bandicoot! Oh. <laughs> I'm joking. Reading a interesting article the other week, which suggests that human civilization has apparently been defined by alcohol and caffeine more than like you'd expect because obviously those are two of the biggest things in the world nowadays like think about everything seems to revolve around either a coffee shop or a bar it's like oh we're going to socialize during the day coffee shop who can socialize at night bar apparently research has suggested that one of the reasons humans sort of got an evolutionary advantage over all the bigger nastier things trying to kill us was the fact that by um eating ethanol from decomposing fruit because they've actually seen monkeys and stuff do this it kills bacteria safer than drinking water is why back in medieval times they used to drink mead for every meal instead of water because you know the water was usually like people shitting in it like a mile upstream but even further back to just eating decomposing fruit and stuff before people sort of worked out how to make wine and because obviously like ancient civilizations a lot of it revolved around around wine you know that was one of the first things that sort of not dying of dysentery was a major evolutionary advantage. Yeah, because isn't that another big contributing factor to switching from a nomadic to a agrarian culture? Then a lot of it was like obviously a storage, but also brewing. You can get it from wild plants. So today they found some made from wild potatoes from thirteen thousand BC, and even earlier, like palm wine in Africa and Asia from sixteen thousand BC. And then they do believe that that was one of the things that motivated agriculture was cultivating these particular crops. So they found uh, China drinking rice wine. You know, that was one of the things they used. The dom- they domesticated rice and one of the first things they did with it was make rice wine. <laughs> what I love about humanity is the two inventions that every culture, you know, when they do these like lost tribes and all that and they, you know, discover them like in the Amazon or Indonesia jungle or something, you know, uncontacted tribes. Or just even contacted ones where you see the history like throughout the world that, you know, from way back when. Is every culture seems to have invented the bow and arrow and a way to get absolutely fucked. <laughs> like, it's like hallucinogenic plants or, <laughs> you know, no other concept of science, but the idea of <laughs> the exact right amount of time and ingredients to decompose fruit in a way that will get you like off your face like that's what like every culture seems to have found a way to do i th- I think it speaks to the you know universal truth that life is hard and obliterating your senses is just a good way of trying to navigate that <laughs> but you're right it is always a staple any sort of travel documentary that tries to cohabit with isolated villages and stuff like the one go-to scene is that they always just hand them like a bowl of some liquid and it gets them monstrously fucked up it just <laughs> exactly you're right I, it's, it's either like a hallucinogenic paste that they put under their eyeballs and they they're just yeah. scr- screaming until it gets edited out <laughs> much like our podcasts <laughs> it doesn't matter if you think like the sun's a fireball being carried on a chariot or you know that the rain is is entirely dependent on whether or not you um appease a particular god but you know that if you mix this and this and add this and leave it for this long you will get fucked but not die but then on the flip side so i said the the two drinks that did it caffeine so apparently it's a bit of conjecture but when I say before, like Europeans especially used to drink alcohol throughout the day. But in the 15th century, the Arabs started to drink coffee. And then there was like, obviously, there was trade from the Arab world to the European world. And interestingly, the article only really talks about the impact it had on Europe. But like during like medieval times, like the Muslim world was sort of the forefront of discovery. And, and ma- maths um, and science and... yeah. Exactly, and I wonder if that stems from it, because obviously, you know, they invented coffee, apparently. But the point was, when it got introduced to uh, Europe, was around, and obviously it would have gone to, you know, if it was trading with the Arab world, then it was places like Venice and the uh, the Italian states that were merchants, you know, Florence and Venice and all that, Genoa. That's where the, uh, the Enlightenment and the uh, Renaissance started. And one of the theories is, you know, you replace alcohol, which, you know, even, you know, small percentages still like has a 
generally deadening effect on the mind. And you replace that with stimulants, and all of a sudden everyone's having these fucking brilliant ideas. I was saying that the Romans did nothing but drink wine, and they seemed to like do all right. <laughs> like they just cut off their tits on wine all the time. So, and then you like managed to build an empire that lasted like two thousand years, <laughs> invented all sorts of stuff. So, again, it's a lot of conjecture. But yeah, but where are they now compared to Starbucks? You know, Starbucks is everywhere, and exactly the Romans are just in books like nerds. <laughs> And then one of the other flip sides is, again, you know, we said everything seems to happen in cafes and coffee houses and stuff. That's, like, where a lot of, like, again, I think it was also a fact that the only people who could afford to be in a coffee shop back in them days when, you know, it wasn't like there was such thing as, like, the welfare state. You basically had to uh, be quite rich, so that's probably another byproduct of it. But, you know, meeting in coffee houses was where loads of, like, big ideas got discussed. It, it feels very subculture a co- coffee shop. Like, not, not so much nowadays with your, your mm. big, like, corporate chains and whatever, but, you know, throughout the 20th century before that, you know, sort of artists and, and poets, like the beat generation of... Mm. I think they all met in, in, you know, coffee shops. Yeah, well, like I say, there's a lot of um, conjecture here. You know, there's research behind it, suggesting it, but nobody can really know for sure if that's the case. And like I say, there's also mitigating that, yes, having a coffee shop, you know, was a good place for ideas to spread and, you know, philosophy and times and stuff like that. But it also probably helps, like, if you're, <laughs> if you're rich and have time to, you know, you're probably educated and then don't really have much to do so you can hang out in a coffee shop. You're probably going to come up with more ideas than the guy who has to work, like, 18 hours a day toiling in a field so he doesn't starve to death you know it might not necessarily be the coffee itself that has like done the done the job yeah, ma- yeah maybe it's it's more if you don't make humans graft as a i don't know like a stonemason for like you say 18 hours a day then it frees up the mind to think about higher things yeah i mean personally it makes sense because i i didn't drink coffee till i was 18 I turned from a real idiot into a, a well caffeinated idiot, so there is, there is a there is logic there. Alcohol and caffeine are the two things that sort of made humanity great, and Jaeger bombs are basically like humanity's like ultimate expression. So what we need is you know the next philosophical movement to come out of a shop that only sells Jaeger bombs. <laughs> yeah, just it'll come out of the student bars yes. is where the next big things come in, or anywhere that sells vodka Red Bulls, like double vodka Red Bulls. What would you say are the two defining things in your life? What, as like opposed to alcohol and caffeine? Yeah. I have no idea. That, that's quite a deep question. Yeah. For you, maybe sharks and crows. No, it'd be uh, sharks and crows. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. I don't have any facts, so that I'll just have to do for this week semi regular. How the fuck have you snuck him in right at the end? <laughs> I saw my opportunity and I pounced, <laughs> which incidentally was what I'll be saying in court. After <laughs> <I can. laughs> you saw the opportunity was you seeing the word crow and going, I could replace that with a word Kurt Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I thought we were going to have one week yeah. without him. Hey, pals. Make sure you keep listening after the outro, because there's a message from some fellow podcasters about their podcast, which we think you'll really enjoy. So, with that, that's my second topic, which means we are finished. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure as always. Hope you enjoyed it more than, or as much as we have enjoyed making it. Goodbye. <laughs> that, that's all I've got. Nailed it, mate. Would you like to say a few words, Chris? Yeah, thank you for listening and goodbye. It doesn't get any slicker than that. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cooking with Grief. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at cookingwithgrief. If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you. Hi, I'm London Homer. I narrate the Foothold Saga audiobook podcast. The Foothold Saga is an urban fantasy series by author Randall J. Wombin. We read two chapters for one half-hour episode every week. Here's a little bit about the book. For thousands of years, the Myrtali Prozer Lacus has provided the Fae with visions of the mortal realm. When William the Wanderer discovers the ancient sites destroyed, he uncovers a dagger belonging to the Queen of Death and Nightmares, Mavash. Journeying to the court of Amaranta in hopes of uncovering the truth behind the dagger, 
William is chosen to lead an expedition into the mortal realm to the city of Seattle, where the forces of the dead queen lurk. So join me and narrators Madison Volley and Caleb Bristol as we embark on book one of the Foothold Saga, Requiem's Dagger, available wherever you get your podcasts. No, that was that was nice. We should probably not ruin it by uh, rambling on. No, no, no. So the worst thing to do now would just be to carry on talking, sort of extraneously, with <laughs> adding no further information to what we've already imparted. No, just sort of generally hoping that people press stop. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would sure. certainly recommend it. I mean, I hopefully they've done it about thirty seconds ago. But if you're still <laughs> listening to this, then you have only yourself to blame. And and us. <laughs> Mostly us. <laughs> I, I'd say it's all us. What are we doing? We're so sorry. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>